Hey everyone, Jeff here and welcome to another video, another in-depth interview with one of my clients, Michael Wen. Um, so Michael, uh, you're in Australia and I think yes. by your accent, it's pretty, pretty clear, but That's Michael right. joined my program, uh, about around Q3 or Q4 of last year, I believe. Yes. Um, and when he joined, uh, he was completely stonewalled, have no contact. And whenever he tried to contact, it was pretty much the crickets, uh, just very little response. And I remember when you first came to me, you asked me, is there hope for me? Is, can I, should I expect anything? And I told you that if you just simply focused on the internal shifts, that's all that matters. And you'll be surprised at how ununique your situation is. And so we fast forward to Q1. Um, we rec we're recording this on February 5th, 2022. So Q1 and that stonewalling is gone. <laughs> You're talking regularly, and she's actually w working on the relationship with you as well. Now, to say you're reconciled, we're not there yet. So this is going to be an interesting interview where, you know, usually we interview people uh, where they they have gone from the zero to hundred, and they've reconciled. They're happier than ever. They're like on their second honeymoon period. And we did an inter interview with Luke Phillips uh, a couple of months back, and in that interview, I also had this midterm interview with him as well. And then also a post, I guess, reconciliation interview. So an interview when he wasn't reconciled yet, but he was mastering the principles in the program so well that I said to him, your situation is guaranteed. Like your results are guaranteed. And I kind of want to make your case the same where we're doing this midterm interview right now. But I want this to show people that in a couple of months time, when you reconcile, I want us to say we called it because I'm that confident in the system. And I think before we started this interview, you told me that you're that confident in the processes and just there's no other better way. There's, there's no possible other better way. So yeah. let's dive deeper into all these details and all these juicy stuff. Um, so, Michael, I guess if you could start us off with tell me the level of stonewalling that you got when you first joined and tell us kind of paint us a picture of. How hopeless were things in the beginning, I guess? <laughs> uh, oh, my goodness. Like, it, you're right. You know, Q3, Q4, around October-ish, uh, uh, pretty much was told, it's done. Like, I'm out. And so, you know, as, as a person, you, you tend to hold on to and want to do everything that you can to fix that situation. Like, you, you get desperate. You, you text. You call. You reach out. I mean, you know, I thought about, it, I thought even like almost like driving there just, just to meet up, but it's, it's like you realize that the more you reach out, the more further away they become, the more that you, you try to, to grapple onto that situation at that time, uh, the more it creates this sort of like, almost like a, I'm a predator about to enter the space and, and recapture this yeah. person. So yeah. the stonewalling was pretty bad. It's, um, and, and, and I don't mean in, in sort of a value sense, I understood the situation like retrospectively now, you know, understand it, but it was like texts unanswered, uh, calls on hold, uh, anything that I would try to do to, to create and manufacture content, uh, I guess, uh, contact would be, I guess, met with extreme resistance. Mm. Um, resistance probably on the, the terms of space, probably on the terms of lack of ability, uh, probably on the terms of it's just, it's so complicated and the situation was so tangled that it was almost impossible to unravel it with um, a text message. It was impossible to unravel it with just uh, visiting and and saying a few lines like there was no way that text messages and a couple of lines was going to solve this like that's that's how I felt and I felt honestly like out of my depth yeah and I think when people go through the stonewalling too you know we say in the program stonewalling is just resistance it's a it's a form of passive resistance in this case and so usually what happens is when you try so hard to like hunt down your partner and try to contact your partner, it makes you sound even more desperate. So you're on the one extreme of like trying to manufacture contact too much. And 
it shows also to your partner that you don't really understand what the problem is usually. That you think you can just fix it with some cheap words here and there. And that actually makes things a lot worse. So, you, yeah. you know, initially our instinct is always to, to always to go, well, if you want to fix it, we have to manufacture contact. But then a lot of people come up with my videos and I say, well, don't do that. Right. And then they hear about this thing called no contact and they kind of play aloof at the same time. Did you try that approach as well? Uh, there was there was like a temptation to do that because I did see some of those videos and I was mm -hmm. like, oh, you know what? Maybe I will just not say anything. Maybe I'll just sit back. But the problem is, what am I doing in the background there? <laughs> you know, like what? As, as soon as I'm doing this no contact thing, um, I, I'm you know, it just didn't feel right to me. It felt like I was um, faking it, if that makes any sense. Uh, you know, the, you go from this sort of uh, like all in, you really care to to this selfish indifference where you're like this person who's um, looking at the situation and going like, I don't care. This this means nothing to me. But deep down inside, you're like gut wrenched. And so yeah. it's um, it's fake. It's fake. That's, it, it's not but that's fake. the the straddle that a lot of people struggle with. And we talk about this in the program, too, where people go into this state of need, then they talk about no contact to try to, I don't know, um, try to in increase intrigue with the partner or whatever it is. Like, yeah. oh, if I take myself away, they would miss me. But then your partner doesn't come closer when you have no contact. And then you start panicking and you go needy again. And they keep like cycling through this thing, never realizing that the answer is never always in the extremes. It's always in the middle. So. Uh, we're going to talk about the middle a bit later, but when you were stonewalled and when she was resisting you, like, what was she saying? What was her justifications for why she didn't even want to talk to you? I mean, you know, you guys have been together for a while at that point. Um, and a lot of people, a lot of men think, well, my partner owes it to me at least to at least give me a shot, at least give me a chance. Mm. Why do you think she didn't in your case? Let's, let's put it this way. I was given many chances throughout the history of our relationship. Um, the chances weren't necessarily in the form that I had recognized, but they were there. Mm. And so at this stage here, um, I'd practically been told your chances are over. The chance for me to do my work and the chance for her to do her work was now. And she wanted to do that separately. Now, of course, that's, that's important to understand because um, the mechanism that I used to operate under was there was, there was, there's no boundaries. There's no barriers within a relationship that, you know, you share literally everything. And it was this sort of uh, like codependence that exists within the relationship where, you know, her problems are my problems, my problems are her problems. And mm -hmm. it was up to me to fix all of her problems and up to her to fix all of my problems. And what was happening there was we weren't giving each other any sort of space at all. Um, the space was the problem. And so when I was faced with stonewalling, what happens is you're trying to break through that space and Try to re trying to recreate that, that mechanism that you think would be helpful in this situation. And, and I thought it would be helpful. But in yeah. actual fact, that what caused the problem in the first place uh, was this lack of space, the lack of ability for uh, someone, myself, her, to, to process what we're going through, to actually uh, find solutions. Because I would jump right back in there and go, no, you're wrong. Mm. I think this is, <laughs> yeah, and I think it's a it's a very interesting paradigm about relationships that people have. It's like the moment you either get engaged or get married or even become boyfriend girlfriend, it's almost like both people just expect the other person to be okay. Now you sign this invisible contract with blood, <laughs> where yeah. what's mine is yours, what's yours is mine, and you know, you have to communicate with me, I will communicate with you and I expect you to do all those things where you expect respect, you expect trust, you expect people to communicate, you expect people to just jump over fences for you at that point in time. But 
what we don't think about is, okay, instead of thinking about what can other people do for me, think about, have I actually created a culture to where it makes it easy for my partner to do that, to respect me, to trust me, to feel safe with me, et cetera. And I think that's the massive paradigm shift that people need to start with before they can get anywhere. Because a lot of people watching the videos, for example, they're like, well, why do I have to do all the work? Well, it's not about you have to do all the work or not. It's that you're the one watching the videos. You're the one in charge of your own life. You're the one in charge of what you can do. You can sit around and get angry and hope that your partner changes her behavior, or you can actually do something to, to start to change your own and start a, a more positive feedback loop. You got two choices. The first choice is useless. You're just being a troll at that point, right? <laughs> the second choice is where you're actually in control of your life. Um, so let's talk about now, right? Fast forward to now, from that stonewalling stages to now, um, describe it. It's, it's as if brick by brick, I was able to take down that wall. Just brick by brick, one at a time. But unfortunately, you know, if you think about it, going back, if I had tried to do that with the old methods that I do, you know, I would, you know, try to break it down with a, with a massive hammer. Uh, <laughs> it, it doesn't work that way. You can't go back in there with a wrecking ball. And so rebuilding uh, by using those bricks, you know, you've got this massive wall and you want to try and rebuild something even greater, but it does require you to actually take those bricks, preserve them, keep them, take care of them, and then place them somewhere else to rebuild something more beautiful. I don't know what that will look like. I don't know if that will look like marriage again. I don't know if that will look like uh, something that's even greater than that. But what I do know is that that level of precision that's required to take those bricks, in this case here, the problems of life, uh, in, in such a very careful way um, happens in the daily. So take, for instance, it might be now uh, a conversation where in the past it would just end off with, oh, we, we both understand that um, this divorce needs to happen to now a conversation where it's not so much about the relationship, but it's just about life. It's about life and things that are important and understanding each other on a life perspective there. So yeah. the conversations are now moving in a more constructive manner as opposed to a destructive one. Yeah. And it makes total sense. Like the way I see it for your case is, you know, where you are right now is to me even better than reconciliation because this is literally the definition of an untouchable, I, I want to use this word, anti-fragile right yeah. so for fragile things objects it can only lead towards degrade degradation right so if you have a box of fragile things in and you transport it somewhere it cannot get better but it can only get worse but if you look yeah. at our let's say for example something that's anti-fragile like our bodies if we get sick and our immune system response, our body can actually get better. So it's the opposite of fragility is anti-fragile, yeah. where conflicts, issues, challenges, difficulties actually makes your relationship stronger, not weaker. Yes. And that's having an anti-fragile relationship is next level shit. <laughs> like, yes. It feels good because <laughs> now you look at, uh, conversations around divorce, conversations around even your past self, and you don't have to be defensive about it. Yeah. But it becomes, <laughs> all conflicts become an opportunity to bond. And if you look at, you know, uh, other parts of life too, even like sometimes war, for example, the, the strongest bonds are formed, are forged in fire, are forged in difficult moments. But that can only happen when you have the right frameworks, the right tools to be able to like turn the negatives into positives. Because you can also see a lot of relationships who break down because of problems instead of they get rebuilt despite the problems, right? And that's, so I want people to listening to this to just understand that reconciliation is not the goal. The goal is, can you create this anti-fragile relationship where it can thrive no matter what? The thriving relationship. If you can do that, the outcome of reconciliation is a guaranteed. In fact, if you can do that, 
the outcome of reconciliation becomes a side effect. It's almost like you want to get 10 million. Yeah, 1 million is just easy. When 1 million is a reconciliation, you're aiming somewhere higher. Yeah. Right. Which is why it. I think we're so confident about we'll get there. <laughs> I mean, my, my, my conviction in the process is, is just how do I explain this? Like, there is, I believe there is actually no other method that I could have come up with myself. Like, as much as I think I'm a smart guy, as much as I think I know how to communicate, the more that I looked into this program, the more that I involved myself into this program, it's, it's like financial literacy. You don't get taught this stuff in school. You don't get taught the, you don't get taught emotional literacy. You don't get taught relationship literacy. Uh, so for me, I felt like I was like, un, like tapping and, and unraveling this massive new level of knowledge, new level of understanding of, of not just like my partner and people, but mostly myself. Mm -hmm. And so it started to change me internally. And so what happened was like going back to the, the stonewalling and resistance stuff, I found myself in a situation where now I'm getting the, the literacy and the ability to, to lean into those resistances. I look at problems now with a bit of joy and excitement. I'm going like, yes, here's, here's a difficult conversation. Yes, here's a problem. Let's, let's dance through this. Let's actually embrace this situation. Uh, nothing's negative unless you make it negative. And so I look at it now and I'm going, there is something here. This is going to be a, an opportunity to, yeah. to grow, an opportunity to, to take advantage of this for the best way forward, rather than just feeling victim to it and blaming people, blaming I others, blaming myself. Yeah, I'm like rubbing my hands together because I want to go to the <laughs> first key takeaway. Uh, and the thing that a lot of pe key, uh, people listening to this will get confused at is, okay, if you're stonewalled, if she's not responding to you, uh, how are you supposed to even, you know, reconcile? How do you even begin to reconcile? And I think there's a couple of points here. The first point is, like you said, the program teaches you to look at stonewalling and see that as a massive opportunity. So I'm going to test you a bit, right? Yeah, good. I know you know the program really well. So when your partner stonewalled you, well, what was your response to her? Like, what did you say next? What did you do next? Uh, what, past self, uh, I would, I would get a bit desperate. I would <laughs> beg. <laughs> I would, I would ask um, for. Um, I would actually just give my opinion outright. I'd be like, "This is what I think." Please, you know. So it's or uh, or tell her like, stonewalling is wrong. You shouldn't do this. Like, we need to communicate if we. Whatever it is, yeah, you lecture her, you tell her, or you beg. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, um, actually, yeah. Even even more so in, in when we were in, um, I guess you know the the early stages of relationship. Um, it was like, you know, I would actually blame her, but like, how dare you? You know, this this isn't how you're supposed to act. This isn't how you're supposed to be. I, you know, I would put on this very sort of aggressive, um, almost uh, like some sort of moral high ground that that actually mm -hmm. doesn't apply to this situation. yeah it's like i'm better than you because i didn't stonewall you when things got hard whatever yeah. it is right or like that, that, that those kind of narratives like well at least you know like no matter how hard things get i would never do stonewalling like this this is total this is not even human this is oh yeah whatever it is right people people tell themselves what about now tell me what you actually did to like actually break through that stonewalling in the end of the day so now I, I view, like, I guess, difficult situations as, as opportunities. So that's the first thing. It's just like going through a bit of a paradigm shift, not seeing these situations as negatives, but realizing that, hey, this is now an opportunity. But once you're given an opportunity, or at least, you know, the way I see it now is I can't just wing it. Like, I can't just walk in there and, and, and say anything that I want to say. Like, I need these, these very specific frameworks like very specific methodologies of actually carrying out a conversation because the old way of doing things got me nowhere. The old ways of doing things was more about uh, pushing forward my hypothetical thinking, pushing forward what I believe and what I felt. Um, now it's about a deep level of understanding, of empathy that enables me to lean into it and say, tell me more. 
Uh, exactly. Let me, let me understand your perspective. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and I think just to, and I, I love that you're using a lot of the lingo in the program, but just to um, make sure that the audience understands this. So the reason why we say that stonewalling is an opportunity is that when you really look at the contents behind stonewalling again, if you watch a lot of my stonewalling videos, people stonewall because they feel an intense lack of safety, right? So one interpretation you could have for stonewalling is that, yes, this is a character problem, that whenever they have problems, they run away from it and they just shut out the world. That's a convenient explanation. But another explanation also is that maybe you've made it so difficult for them to talk to you. Maybe the problem has gone so complex. Maybe you've made it clear that talking to you has no point, has zero point because of the many promises you made in the past, the false promises you made in the past. That she goes, whenever you reach out, she goes, fuck this. I don't want to, this is a waste of my time. I've wasted my time talking to this guy so many times, trying to explain to him stuff so many times, trying to explain my feelings. He doesn't get it. At the end of the day, your partner will go, fuck it. I'm sure you felt this in your life before. You've had some people in your life where you go like, there's nothing I can say to this person. I'm, and every time I talk to this person, I just feel worse, a lot worse about my life, about the world. I'm sure you've stonewalled people before. You have, all right? So when other people are stonewalling you, it, you're taking the same compassion towards it. And when you see it like that, you see stonewalling as an expression in itself. It's an expression of how desperate, how unsafe your partner actually feels. And when you see it like that, when you get stonewalled, instead of getting angry, you can maybe respond with another message saying like, hey, you know, if I was you, <laughs> I would stonewall myself as well. And the framework, when you talk about specific frameworks, a lot of people will look at that and go, well, that's easy. I can say that. But saying I understand that you would feel I would feel like that too is a weak execution of that like you need to know the framework so well to the point where you know I always say this right expressing something to your partner to where she says yes I feel understood she says that is easy people can do that within a week in the program but for her to for you to be able to paraphrase and speak to her so that she's moved that's the next level. And I think when you talk about, you need to understand, you cannot just wing it. You need to use the specific frameworks and really master that to respond to tough situations like stonewalling or even gaslighting in this case. That's what you're referring to. It's like, you gotta know it so well in, it, it, it embeds it down to the micro expressions the micro tones as well. I mean, I don't wanna speak for you, but that's how I see a lot of clients doing it, right? That's, that's exactly it. Like, um, you know, I'm kind of half smiling here because, you know, everything that you mentioned is everything that I experienced. It's, it's as if um, the situation, you know, you know the situation. It's, it's nothing unique. I think thousands of people out there are going through the exact same thing every single day. Uh, one of the things you mentioned was the, the resistances that I was facing. And it's, you know, around psychological safety, emotional safety. Uh, you know, the, the lack of ability for us to even break down all of these components of, of difficulty. And so what I started to see was, you know, it was going through very specific campaigns, very specific uh, conversations that would focus in on one of those layers at a time. You know, it wasn't like going in there with a sledgehammer or Hulk smashing and, and trying to solve all the problems. That's not going to work. Um, it layers was being, to it. Yeah. yeah, there are layers and, and it's about being surgical as well. It's, it's actually, you know, deeply thinking about the other person, deeply thinking about your own past behavior and, and, and really just <clears throat> not just like meditating on that, but like strategically um, unraveling all of those, those issues, unraveling all of the things that like, for example, it may be certain toxic faces that I may have had. It may have been a certain... Uh, mindsets that I have, like my, my mm. ultra hypothetical thinking where, oh, I'm always right. Um, it may have been some of the things that I may have said in the past that were very specific uh, to our relationship that now I'm able to 
really go back and be surgical and it's kind of like like a scalpel cut those out and, and lift them yeah. out yeah so i think just to summarize for a lot of people too like the the reason why um michael uses the word surgical here is and this is the second point if you're people if you're someone going through stonewalling you got to know this when you are going through stonewalling the first step is you got to understand how to debunk what is the exact reason for my stonewalling why i'm getting stonewalling is it the lack of safety lack of trust lack of ability or lack of space you say that the four roots of resistance right and here what you're basically saying is okay in the beginning it was lack of trust or and lack of safety but then also there was a hint of lack of ability for example now if let's say your the reason for your stonewalling is lack of ability what you want to do is to make it easier for her to be able to express herself. And we talk about this notion of um, creative constraints in our program, right? Where if I, pe if I tell someone, for example, invent something new, invent something that the world has never seen before, just anything, it can be anything, anything you can think of. It's really hard to do that. Like literally, if you're watching this video, pause it and try to think about something. All right. But if I narrow it down to invent a new candy that nobody has ever seen before, suddenly it's easier. I can invent a new candy right now. Right. If you constrain a problem, it helps people to have the ability to actually be creative, to actually express themselves a lot better. And so what the framework you're talking about was the framework that allows that provides this creative constraints to where your partner listening to you now it doesn't feel this lack of ability anymore where she can express herself much easier instead of you hearing you call and going, I don't know what the fuck, well, I don't know where, where to start, forget it, right? Mm -hmm. So that's an example of how you battle against this lack of ability stonewalling. And there's of course other frameworks to lack of trust, lack of safety, too much to get into it now, but that's what you're speaking about. It's like that surgical approach of like, okay, I got to identify this, I have to cut this, splice it here and then like that, right? I agree. Yeah. And I mean, I, I kind of wish that I had V3 um, of, of the program, but like, because you, you mentioned this, this, uh, this, this method of treating the hemorrhage. Uh, and that's, that's something that I, I didn't have when I started. So I kind of like flailed about a bit for a while. But um, as now, now that we've sort of updated things, I'm looking back and I'm going, oh, that would have been so useful. So uh, <laughs> yeah. it's, it, it's funny because like uh, we launched V3, the success rate is like, much higher. Like I'm, my calendar is booked for the next four months for this interview. So it's kind of crazy right now. Yeah. But there you have, you have some people who still complain about like, oh, I don't have everything I need. It's like, dude, do you realize there are students in V1 and V2? They got <laughs> yeah. less than you and I got much more success than you. So you have no excuse here. <laughs> oh, right. it's yeah, it's, it's next level, but you know, it's, it's like, how to explain it. You can't even like, this is deeper than a university course. It's like a university course on me, you know, yeah, it's like, it is deep. Yeah. I think the hardest part about creating this program is a lot of the stuff we talk about is trying to get you be, to become aware and shift and change stuff that's deeply in your subconscious. Right? Mm -hmm. So for example, for a lot of people listening to this, the way they perceive and see stonewalling and the way they react to it in a negative way, sometimes they, they get disgusted by it. They get, turned off by people who stonewall them and they get upset by that. That's a result of very deeply held subconscious beliefs that often you like, like if I ask you, why are you so upset at people stonewalling? You can't even answer that. So for me to create a course to like, let you identify, here's exactly the subconscious stuff and here's why you have it. And for you, for me to shift it, that's really hard. That's why the program is like over a hundred hours now. Um, it's, it's like rich, but I want to get back to this point of stonewalling. So first point we talk about was you need to be able to turn these stonewalling moments from negative to positive. And when you turn it from negative to positive, you're turning it in a very surgical way, depending on your particular scenario. Um, and while, while the particular scenario might look unique, it can only fall into the four categories. That's it. That, 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 that encompasses 100% of the reasons why people stonewall usually. The third is the lesson of that your partner is always watching. Mm. Even if she says that she's not watching, she's not interested in watching, she doesn't want to watch, she's watching. Because then the reason why we say this is there was a point in time in your partner's life where she chose you. 
she made a dream about her future with you. She chose you. And so a lot of people are right in that your partner is not going to just up and leave and just go bye bye. But the, the thing that people don't understand is your partner cannot subconsciously make it easy for you. Cannot. Because she knows that the true you is shown by what you do when things are hard, what you do when things are hopeless, what you do when you get curveballs. Because she wants to know that your desire to work on yourself is unconditional. So the example I always give is, you know, and I get really sad when people do this in the program. They sign up for the program. They, they go to the masterclass. They fill up the survey. And they tell me, Jeff, I'm all in. Like, I want to work on myself, right? I got to do this for my partner. I got to do this for my future self. Then a week later, their partner says to them, ah, there's no hope. And then they give up. Now imagine this. Imagine he's a guy who's been promising his partner, I will change, I will change, I will do anything. And their partner goes, okay, we'll see, we'll see. You'll do anything you say to change. And you'll change no matter what you say. Okay, what if I tell you there is no hope for this relationship? And instantly they go, well, forget it then. It's like, what, what happened to no matter what? You just lied to him, right? Um, and that's, I think, the initial thing you felt as well, of like having to untether from having your motivation to reconcile be your partner to just growing yourself. Tell me that journey for you as well. Yeah, I guess, you know, as, as a person, you're like growing up, I was always focused on an outcome, you know, like here's, here's a vision of something, let's achieve that. You know, I was, I was told before, like, you know, your vision is so strong that it's almost impossible to argue against. Now that's great in business. That's great in, in education. It's great in other domains. It sucks in relationships. Like if you're the one person who is controlling the vision and outcome of everything, then you're the person who is essentially this dictator of the relationship. So, you know, being hyper outcomes focused, um, going into the, the program, you know, I'm thinking that's it. That's the outcome I want. Let's, <coughs> let's make this happen. But the more that you delve into it, the more you realize that it's about these internal shifts that get you to a place of, of I guess, what I now call effort and surrender. You know, there's this place where you have this outcome. The outcome exists, but it's not the thing that you zone in on. It's not the thing that you focus on all the time. In actual fact, yeah. you have to surrender to it. You have to surrender to, to the many different outcomes that are possible as well. But there's also the effort side of things, which is, hey, now it enables me to put in all of my efforts, all of my efforts into the process, all of my efforts into what I do daily. That's more important. Um, I can't just like, the difference would be, for example, uh, me, you know, getting a full makeover, getting six pack, you know, going to the gym, um, earning a million bucks, right? And then going, look, is this what you wanted? Are you not entertained, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's not what people want. You know, that's not what they want. They want to see these internal shifts. And so, yes, it, it is difficult. There, there are moments where I am challenged. There are moments where uh, my internal shifts are really tested, where um, take, for instance, my BPV gets really challenged. And that's the moments where I start to recognize, hang on, uh, how would I react in the past versus how am I going to take on this opportunity now as I am? And, and I imagine that, you know, my partner is seeing that, seeing, yeah. oh, this is a difficult situation where in the past it would have played out this way, but now it plays out in this way. Yeah, it's, uh, she's always watching, but I think the hard part that people always mistake is we're not just trying to tell you, well, just do the opposite. Just do different things. Like, no, no, no. Not all <laughs> different things are good, right? Like. Yeah. Again, we always see people jumping from one extreme to the other, like contact to no contact, contact to no contact, uh, need to indifference, then go back again. But they, they always can never get to the middle. So, you know, I don't know if you watched um, this show 
Cobra Kai. Did you watch that? Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. So I don't know if you guys watched it, but like it shows the story of this uh, two dojos, right? I don't, I'm only like a few episodes in, so I don't know much about it. But like the, the, this two dojos who's like embracing this really extremes, right? One is good, one is bad, basically. <laughs> but what they don't, they don't realize is like both their approaches are actually wrong. Neither the good approach or the bad approach is right. It's the middle approach. They should combine yeah. that stuff into in the middle. And it's kind of the same thing here where the, finding the middle is hard and finding the right middle is hard. And I think that's what you're saying too of like when you can find the right middle in, in the example of the stonewalling one where you can find the surgical way where you can deliver and handle stonewalling and you can be consistent about that. And you're consistent because you are doing this for the sake of the process itself. You're doing this because you're, you want to grow by itself, regardless of what happens with the relationship, whatever it is. Your motivation is 100% on the effort and surrender, the process, where you can be consistent with it, no matter what she says. That's when she goes, hmm, this is real. Because in the past, he was conditional. I would always see his motivation fluctuate up and down, depending on what I said, depending on how hopeful this is. But now he's kind of steady. And it's not really steady. He's actually steady in the correct ways. And that's how you break through what we call that paradox of change. Whereas you change, people will really not believe you for a while, but then with consistency in the right actions, people go, yeah, I, I, I buy it. And I think that's where you are right now. You've broken through that and you're on the uprise right now. Which yeah, feels this, this is like a new norm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's it. So, Let's close that chapter on like the stonewalling. And so a lot of people, they, they just get dumbfounded when I say stonewalling is not a big issue because they don't know how to deal with it. And so I hope this shows people kind of the layers you need to actually bust through stonewalling and why we say in the videos and so on, like if you're getting stonewalled, your situation isn't even that bad. Like you're fine. <laughs> you know? If you have the right process, you're going to be okay. Um, but I want to go to the next takeaway, which is, uh, you said here, basically, you don't have all the answers, but you will cultivate a process to find them. Tell me what you mean here. So, you know, look, going back to this sort of hypothetical thinking that I had, like someone who knows all the answers, uh, and, and it really does come to, you know, our society always encourages us to have the answers. Our society encourages us to always have opinions, to be strong-willed. I think those are sort of uh, very interesting aspects of, of, dare I say, people, but specifically masculinity. You know, to to be the strong-willed person who who is unwavering and unchanging, uh, narrow-minded. I know what I like. I know what I dislike. Therefore, I have all the answers to life itself. And what this this sort of time has allowed me to do is really look internally, to to recognize that hey, I don't have all the answers. In actual fact, every answer that I had actually got me to this place in the first place. So finding a method to get those answers, to be antithetical, to uh, find those win-wins in a conversation where the answer doesn't come from myself, but it comes from a deep empathy, a deep understanding of the other person. Uh, no longer the, the answers that I sort of propose or answers that, that come out of the conversation, I just, hey, this is it. This is what we need to do. It's now an actual discussion. It's yeah. now a place where uh, there's a win for you. There's a win for me. There's opportunities for us to not even have a solution, but just the mutual understanding itself is a win. Like sometimes you don't even need to fix all of the problems. Sometimes it's just getting to the level where you can go through the process where your understanding of the person is so deep. And, and I mean, deeper than, than what you could ever think of, but to some extent deeper than what they've even thought of, of themselves, that it's, it's almost a revelation that that mutual understanding almost solves the problem itself. Yeah. There's so nothing else that can be said. There's three different angles we can approach this antithetical thinking through. And I love you brought up all those points because these three points, nobody understands <laughs> unless you're in the program. So let's look at the first point. This antithetical thinking, um, you know, a lot of people looking at your story of going from Stonewall to this, 
they'll always say, that's not possible. His situation must be different, must be, he must have some advantage, something that allows him to break through stonewalling, but I, the way I see it, I can't break through it, all right? And so the first dimension of antithetical thinking here is just knowing that you cannot solve your problems with the same knowledge that created the problems in the first place. Yeah. And so a lot of people, you know, they look at sometimes your story or my client stories or my claims as to how your no situation is impossible. And they say, that's that, what you're saying is impossible. But if I ask them, what knowledge are you using to tell yourself that it's impossible? Most likely it's the same knowledge that you use to create the problem in the first place. So how can you be skeptical of something using the same knowledge that got you there, that limited you in the first place, you know? It doesn't make sense, right? Um, and it's the same thing for my business too. It's, I tell people, well, I have 25,000 subscribers right now and we rack in last month, 170K, 180K. Um, a lot of people will say that's fucking impossible. There's no fucking way you, do, you can do that with that number of subscribers. But we do. And you see the number of clients just pouring in in the program. Yeah. But that's also because when I first formed this business and the way I structure my YouTube videos and so on, it's antithetical as well. It's, I always ask myself, like, what don't I know so that I can keep expanding the horizon of what's possible? And I think this first takeaway is like, when you become antithetical, you start to expand the horizon of what's possible. And I think for you, it's the same thing. When you went to the program, you had a certain idea of what's possible. But then as you get into it, further into it, and you see all these stories by other people, you start to see, shit. What I thought was level five was the highest level. It's like at level 50 right now. I mean, what was your experience in that as you go through the program as well? Oh, it's, uh, it's fascinating. It's like you go in there, you think, oh, I've learned one thing. And then you realize the complexity of that one thing. And then you move on to the next module. And then you understand the complexities of that. And then you go on to the next module and then the next phase. And then all of a sudden you're asked to go back and redo it all again. <laughs> and, and, and I love that because, you know, this, there's, there's a real practicality to that learning process. It's, it's essentially asking me, hey, you think you have all the answers, Michael, but what you don't realize is that you can only find other pathways, other opportunities, other outcomes if you have different inputs. And so going through that reiteration process uh, of, of just the, the hypothetical thinking, the, the antithetical thinking, finding those, those syntheses in the middle. That's, that's a process that really took a lot of time for me to wrap my head around. Mm -hmm. But what happens is it's now changed the way that I think about everything in life. <clears throat> like, you know, I don't want to sound like someone who's, who's like pitching this. It's more so like you could apply this, not just to relationships, you could apply this to your health, you can apply this to your business, your career. You could, so it's, it's almost coming out in, in all these other spaces in my world as well. So, you know, it's, what's funny is like, I can talk about all of these difficult situations that I went through in the past with a smile now, you know, because I, I look at it as like, that's a learning point for me now because I can take that lesson and apply that elsewhere. So the, the depth of what I've seen in the program every single day hasn't just been for this one thing. Uh, which is why it's so complex and, and probably why you asked us to do it once and then do it one more time. And then, it's, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So just to, on this first takeaway on being antithetic for people who are listening, right? If you were ever skeptical of what's possible, right? You listen to all these stories and you think, no, mine is different somehow. I would just encourage you to ask three questions. How could I be wrong? What am I missing? And what am I misunderstanding? And ask yourself, are you using the same knowledge that created the problems in the first place to be skeptical of what's possible? Because when you start to just operate with a sense of humility, you will start to understand that, yeah, there is a higher level. It's almost like, uh, I give the example of the 10 second barrier thing in the program, where if you look at 70 years ago, seven zero years ago, 
it was considered impossible for the human race to run the 100 meter dash under 10 seconds. That's why it's called the 10 second barrier. You can look at this up, right? But what if those people were antithetic? <laughs> and, and, and instead of hypothetic saying like, that's impossible based on what I know, that's impossible. What if they asked themselves, how could I be wrong? What am I missing? What am I misunderstanding? They might've broken that 10 second barrier much faster. <laughs> That's it. Right. And someone actually did that to break this 10, 10 second barrier. So champions in life always are antithetic, which brings us to the second point, which is this antithetic side thinking. We talk about this concept of becoming water a bit and becoming kind of a shapeless character. You can be introverted, you can be extroverted, you can like whatever you want. You have really, you can like, prefer, you can play whatever character that you want. Tell me your experience in that as well. And that freedom that it gives you, because I, I find it very freeing personally to be able to just oh, yeah. like play whatever character you want, you know? Oh, uh, well, firstly, I'll just backtrack there because, mm. you know, the, the becoming water thing, I think is, is super important to what's possible now. So take, for instance, a lot of people might think, and, and even I myself would think, oh, that's it. This is done for. You know, there's, there's no point in trying. There's no point in, in even creating uh, or manufacturing or, or even attempting to, to reconcile. Where I am now, I honestly think 99% of people would look at it and say, this is, this is strange. Like people just don't do this after a relationship finishes. You know, like I, I would have thought, like if I had a friend in the past who had gone through this, I'd be like, what are you doing? You know, you, you, like, you should just move on. Like, this has honestly untapped something that I never even thought was possible, was the, the level of connection that is now possible uh, wasn't even seen when we were in a relationship. So, so that antithetical mindset, uh, mindset is, is something that honestly created a completely different environment, created a completely different situation for anything to move forward now. I think that's beautiful. So going back now to the water aspect of it, that antithetical thinking, that's enabling me to, to like, if I could go from zero to a stronger level of communication understanding than I've ever had before in my entire life, where else can I find that in my life? What else can be different? And all of a sudden I realized that the internal shifts that I start to look at, like, oh, I start embracing these things. I start uh, perhaps, you know, trying different foods. I start trying different uh, mindsets. I start trying different uh, ways of going about problems. That's now growing me internally. That's becoming um, a part of me. It's not like me faking. It's like me going back to, yeah, yeah going to a person so, saying, oh, look, yeah. yeah. So, so let's take, to take a look at the two misconceptions people have about it. One is like the methodology of how you become water. And the second is about, does it make me less genuine and less of a real person, right? So just for people to get context here, and Michael, chime in if you, if you feel like I'm missing something. Please. Um, you know, if you look at the way people live their lives, they always like to define who they are, right? So they go to a department store and they say, this is our, this clothes is me. These clothes are not me. They go see some friends. These friends are me. These people, they're not me. They go to movies. This is me, not me. Music, me, not me. Everything is me, not me. They're trying to define who they are. So over time, they start to have this smaller and smaller and tighter and tighter definition of this is who I am and this is who I'm not. This is what I like, what I don't like, what I can and cannot do. And this becomes so entrenched in your identity that you start to judge what you're not. This is why if you look at politics, if you look at the world, if you look at relationships, the reason why people fight, break down, disagree, is because one identity, the way someone identifies themselves is different from how others identify themselves. They clash and nobody wants to change their minds. Everyone judges the other side. Riots, wars, just, you know, hate whatever it is, right? The way you unjam yourself is you again, ask antithetical questions, right? Okay, I like this food. I like 
this movie. I like this philosophy. I like whatever you like. What is the other side? What is the merit to the other side, right? Why is the other side valuable? So if you're introverted, why is extroversion valuable? If you are organized, why is being not organized valuable? And there is value in that, right? There is value in everything. Like if you are, the, the, the greatest example of this is like um, greed versus generosity. I love this one because this, this hits home for me as an entrepreneur. Because like a lot of people say, oh, you have to be generous, generous, generous. Well, I know some people who are so generous, they can't charge a premium for what they do. They keep giving away shit for free and they become bankrupt. Guess what? When they become bankrupt, they can't create the value and be generous. Some people are too greedy on the other extreme. And of course, nobody likes people who are greedy. So either when you're too generous or too greedy is not the right answer. The right answer is always in the middle again. The answer is like, again, in life, how can we get more to the middle about your opinions, whatever it is. And when you can get to the middle, that's when you can flow through life really easily, right? Not only can you like whatever you want. So like if my partner likes, you know, makeup and fashion and cooking, and I don't like that before, I can like that. And now that's a part of my life that I can share with her, right? And that's, that makes things so much easier. Um, if I, for, for example, for me too, when I first started my business, I was not an extrovert. It took me two and a half hours to record two minutes of YouTube. I was terrible. But then I found this extroverted side. Now I can kind of transition between extroversion, introversion, and you become water. You can play whatever character you want That's to it. be successful. And I want to close with this and I want to let you speak here. True freedom and power in life. It's not about doing what you want and avoiding what you don't want. A lot of people think like, oh, my idea of true freedom and power is having a bunch of money, having a bunch of time, and I can do whatever the fuck I want. I can avoid whatever I don't want. I can be whoever I want to be and avoid what I don't want to be. But to me, true power and freedom, you know, that to me was slavery. You're enslaved by your bubble. You're enslaved by who you are. You're enslaved by your likes and dislikes. But to me, true freedom and power is about being able to become whoever you want to become to accomplish what you want, becoming water. Let me pause there. <laughs> that was a lot. So, well, I, yeah. No, no, no. Like, <laughs> I, I just wanted to like stream off of that. You know, one of the biggest things that I took away from this was, you know, it's, it's not like you think yourself as a smart person, right? Or some people think like, oh, I'm a strong-willed person. Like put those things together in, in my life, you know, being smart or, or being strong willed got me places. <clears throat> but they say like, you know, it's not the, the smartest or the strongest who survive. It's those who can adapt. Mm. And, and I think this program, you know, has really let, enabled me to, to find a pathway to adapting. And I think that's the most difficult thing in this life, because the more that you think you're strong, the more you think you're smart, the more you think you figured out life. And so you're most likely to, to channel your, your pathway or you're channeling your efforts towards the path of least resistance. You'd say, that's what's always worked for me, therefore I do that. So this antithetical thinking ultimately has now put me into a place where everything is new. Like myself is new, my, my future is new, like the possibilities are new. But more than that, it's, it's enabled me to see, well, what's what didn't work in the past? And it enables me to improve that as well. So it's not just like ditching my old self. It's not just like, you know, throwing everything out. It's actually this, what we call like is the process of success. It's, it's reiterating ourselves, finding different possibilities to the point where honestly, sky's the limit. Like, like I yeah. honestly feel like there's, there's nothing that we can't take on. We are unstoppable in this. Yeah. And so just to close off that section, when you talk about being adaptable, we're talking about being ad adaptable in the macro sense of like, okay, how can, can you transition from, you know, you two in the relationship being in the early stages of the relationship to the mature stages, to you getting married, to you having kids and you being a dad and the, and the demands of that, can you be adaptable through the macro sense by being antithetic? But in the micro sense as well, when in a conversation, do you know when to be compassionate? Do you know when to be gentle? And do you know when to be assertive? 
And do you know how to balance the two and move around and fluidly go between the two? Because a lot of people can't. A lot of people can't even go home from work and let go of their work mode to go into daddy mode, to go into family mode. They can't even do that. They're not, they're too solid. They're too rigid in them, their identity. And so a lot of the other question people ask too is like, does this make me ungenuine? No. You know what's, a lot of people say like, well, if you have no character, then who are you then? When whatever you do, you're not yourself. Who are you? Let's break down this concept of genuineness. Being genuine is not about doing, being who you are, okay? So the example I always give is like, if you, if your partner tells you, let's go, uh, sh- go to Sephora and go shop for some makeup and you fucking hate makeup. You're like, oh my God, I hate going there to Sephora, <laughs> if, which is like a makeup shop in the US. I don't know if you have that. In oh, yeah. You do, right? <laughs> okay, perfect. <laughs> I realize you're not in the US, so. Yeah, I'll um, spend hours there. <laughs> yeah, perfect. <laughs> and then you say, well, I'm someone who doesn't like makeup, but for you, I'll do it, right? For you, I'll go. So you reluctantly go because you don't, even though you don't enjoy it. Is that genuine? To me, it's not genuine, right? You're doing something that doesn't fit who you are. But if I can become water and I can like whatever I want to like, it's like, Sephora, fuck yeah, let me have fun with that. Like, I want to learn why you like it. You are genuinely actually enjoying being there. That's genuineness to me, right? That's we, we, congruence. Yeah. So people don't understand what genuineness means. Having no character and having this fluid character is the most genuine way to live life because that's the only way you can genuinely love being in everywhere you are at the same time, you know? I love that illustration because literally a week ago, we went like into a cosmetic store. <laughs> <laughs> like for the first time in ages. And, and she's like, oh, you could just, you know, wait outside. You no, know? I want to be I in this. First, <laughs> yeah, I, I was the first one to walk in there. You know, it's like, <laughs> it was like, I loved it. You know, it's like yeah. completely different to what I was before. But yeah. that, that wasn't like a faking. It. That was honestly like from inside. Yeah, it was, it was an honest moment for me. An, yeah. an honest moment, yeah. Um, do you mind if we go about 15 minutes over? That's all right. Keep it okay. going. Now, we talk about the first dimension of antitheticness, which is expanding your band of operation and expanding your band of possibility. Second is expanding your band of operation and being more fluid, becoming whoever you want to be to get to where you want to go. Now, let's translate that to the relationship a bit. And you mentioned this 20 minutes back now, but it's when you said, when you're having a conversation, it's no longer about, let me tell you and you tell me, which is how most people communicate, but it's about communicating from a place of curiosity of asking yourself instead of, instead of, I know I'm right. So let me tell you I'm right. It's how can I be wrong? What am I missing? What am I misunderstanding? And coming from that position, right? Um, and this is kind of the balance where you are balancing hypotheticness and also antitheticness, where a lot of people are at the hypothetic stage where they, they're too controlling, they're too, too certain of themselves. But then you can go to the other side, which is being too uncertain of yourself. But then the middle is when you can say something like, for example, hey, um, here's what I'm thinking, right? Uh, I'm thinking... <laughs> this decision would be a bad idea. And we use this in divorce a lot, right? So people are going through divorce. The first thing, the framework is like, hey, um, I understand you want divorce, but to me, here's the reason why I'm scared about divorce. Why, you know, I'm, I'm kind of delaying things about it. And I may not think it's a good idea, but it seems like, you know, partner, you're not really too worried about that. You're not really concerned about the things I'm concerned about. So tell me your thinking on those things. And maybe... I'm missing something here. Maybe there's something I don't see. Can you help me see what you see? When you approach a conversation like that, it's really hard for people to resist that. Tell me your experience that. Like, I'll just let you speak here a little bit. I think one of the biggest things that humanity needs or wants is connection. So in a, in a conversation, it's not about what I think versus what you think. It's how can I understand you more? And I think when you go into a a situation where there is resistance, 
the, the biggest or the easiest way that I found to dissolve that is to find that moment of connection. So now it's like, oh, if there is some sort of difficulty, if there is some sort of uh, issue, if there is some sort of discomfort, it's not necessarily fighting against that discomfort or fighting against the difficulty. It's deeply understanding it so that you can feel connected or I can feel connected more than ever to the other person. That for me has been a, a, a sort of a game changing thought because what it enables me to understand is it's not necessarily the problem that I need to solve. It's not necessarily the situation that I need to fix or maybe even tell them what to do. It's, it's more about going deep into the other person's situation, empathizing with them at a level that almost like they feel like this person gets me, this person understands me. And if this person understands me, then they're able to be in a place where we can both work things out. And I think that's, that requires that connection. Like you're not going to trust someone to help you with your problem. You're not going to trust someone to help you out with your life unless you feel like they actually get your life. <laughs> Cause if you can't, if you can't like, let's say like, for example, if I'm going through a problem and even I can't fix it myself, how is it that someone else who doesn't even know the surface of it, like can't even get beneath the surface of it, how is it possible for them to even fix it? How is it yeah. possible for them to even work on it? So Yeah, and, and, and that's the, the essence of persuasion, of building trust, right? It's like the essence of persuasion. You know, I, I, I love it when people like, um, anyway, I, I won't go there, but the essence of persuasion is like, you have to make the other person feel understood first. It's not about what you say, but really what you ask and how you really get to the same level playing field in the same plane of existence as the other person. And I think the part that a lot of people struggle at is they, again, are stuck in the layer of the problem itself. A typical problem that it, people consider irreconcilable are things like, well, I want children, you don't want children. They're stuck in that problem level and they can't reconcile because they don't understand that beneath the desire to have children or not to have children is actually the same basic human needs. You have Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you need safety needs, you need esteem needs, whatever. It's the same basic needs. So, the, you know, the way we go about fulfilling those needs may be different, but at, and at the core of every human being, it's the same basic human needs. And when you can get the conversation through antithetic questioning to those same basic core needs, you realize suddenly, wow, I'm actually a lot more similar to my partner than I thought. Even though we are differing in this seemingly irreconcilable thing, we're actually more similar than we thought. And it's amazing to me how people have used this principle to really reconcile despite having this child problem, despite having the divorce problem, right? Like I have couples who discover, okay, the reason why I as a woman want children is that I feel out of control of my life. I feel like there's no project that I can take control of. I feel like my life has no purpose and children is my purpose. Well, once you get to that level, you realize that having children or not is not the question. The question is, how do we help you find your purpose? Then you can start talking about finding some win-wins and some resolutions that you never have thought of before. But if you're staying stuck in the cycle of, children or no children, of course you can't reconcile it, right? Like that's impossible. And the same thing goes for divorce, desire for separation, desire for wanting to work on the relationship. Underlying it, people have the same core human needs and it's up to you whether you have the antithetic ability and the frameworks to be able to go down to that core, establish the rapport and that you're the same level playing field. And then from that, finding solutions together as a team as well. You know, that's how I see it, the flow of this thing, right? Yeah, that the understanding enables me to actually get to that point. Like there's, otherwise, otherwise there's no point. There's no point. There's it's no just point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the question people ask at this point is like, well, are you saying that I can have a relationship with anyone I want? It's like, yeah, <laughs> pretty much. That is the beauty of it. Like, there's no mystery to it. Like a lot of people, they go, oh, I click with this person. I don't click with this person. Oh, 
this person fits me, this person doesn't fit me. It's like, why limit yourself like that? You know, like, what if you can just go about life and go, I can click with anyone I want because I can be antithetic and I can find that core thing that really connects us all. Whether you, what, no matter what country you're from, no matter what race you're from, no matter what ethnicity you're from, like a lot of people say, oh, I'm Dutch. So, you know, the date, the relationship culture here is different. No, <laughs> you could be Dutch, but you're still human and you're human with the same basic human needs. If you can connect on that, it doesn't matter if you're Dutch or Spanish or whatever it is, who cares? Man, woman, who cares? <laughs> That's it. I love that because it, then it makes all of the past problems, all the differences that were brought up like, oh, you know, we're just different this way. You know, we just didn't get along with this or I can't agree with you on that. That's no longer a problem anymore. That's it's not that's a problem. Actually, yeah, that's yeah. I, I love that. So, yeah, yeah. That's how I'm yeah. Gonna it's something I've been this. it's something I've been thinking about, too, of like, you know, uh, Samantha, Samantha, my partner, she has a brother who is eight years old now. So she's 27. She has a brother that's eight-year-old, so massive age gap. And so this kid, he has a very different childhood than me. So like sometimes the videos he watches and the humor he likes, at first I was like, this is funny to you, right? <laughs> but then I was like, let me be antithetic here. Let me try to figure out why he likes his stuff. And I realized this antithetic thinking allows me to span generations, to span gender, to span all these cultures because I can understand anybody I want. Or I can appreciate anything I want. And it's such a freeing feeling to live life by because you're, the world is literally your oyster now, you know, if <laughs> you live like that. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's it. Yeah. Um, so last thing here, like you talk about the in importance of the internal shifts. And mm -hmm. what I want to lead with this is, you know, I think this is the deepest interview I've done in a while, meaning like we went deep into the specifics of so many things. And I love it. And, you know, someone can understand, let's say the frameworks of how to say things, how to be antithetic and how to ask antithetic questions, but the internal state of being antithetic, that's your identity and, and being compassionate and being someone who can thrive in, through stonewalling. Like what's, what's that, like describe the feeling for me when, you went from the surface to just knowing the frameworks here and there to actually becoming that. Like, how did it change? How would you describe that change for you? Okay, so there's there's two things in this. Um, I'll use two analogies. The first feeling that I got was in the beginning. It's like, oh, I'm, I'm getting all this new information, and it honestly it felt overwhelming. It felt like this is this is quite a lot to take on. But the more that I started to apply it, the more that I started to reiterate it, the more that I started to practice it, the more it became genuine within me. Now, now I want to use this analogy of, you know, like cups, for instance. Um, we were two cups in, in, a, in a relationship and in a codependent relationship, um, I was pouring into her, she was pouring into me and we were two half filled cups. And unfortunately, with entropy and everything that happens in this world, there's going to be spills in between. So over the course of the relationship, what happens is those two cups become empty. And then you've got nothing left to pour into each other. So now I'm starting to realize that this whole journey has been about... Just uh, filling sorry up. to pause there. It's like yeah. when you say entropy, it means like as you have troubles in life, you have conflicts, you have life events that is can be traumatic. It takes away from you and your partner as well. That's what you mean when you say the spillage. Oh, right? yeah. <laughs> yeah, perfect. So that's just to it. clarify yeah, that. It. But yeah, anyway, um, you were saying this journey is to fill your cup. Go ahead. Yeah, so that's it. Like, you know, things get in the way of, of relationships, of life, even yourself. You know, you can essentially empty yourself uh, just, just through the, the challenges of life. But now I'm starting to realize that it, this whole journey has been about filling up me. And it gets me to the point where I could be so fulfilled, I can be so ready that I can fill someone else's cup or many different people's cups, but I constantly have the process and the source to fill up myself consistently. I'm not depending on anyone else to fill me up. Yeah. So that puts me in a very powerful position now 
I'm no longer dependent on someone else. I become interdependent with other people. So yes, I'm getting some energy from others. I'm getting, you know, life and I'm getting goodness from people. But at the same time, I know how to cultivate that myself. Uh, and that's important because now I'm in a position, I guess what we call noble selfishness. It's this, this concept where you have this ability to, to really look after yourself, but you, you are noble enough to, to, to be able to share that with the people around you. Uh, mm -hmm. That's, that's important. Uh, yeah. Second, sorry, you want to you want to jump yeah, into no, that? I I didn't want to uh, add a few points because that's such a beautiful analogy. Uh, I've never heard of that one, but it makes so much sense, right? And I'm working on this, uh, like a revision to that module about noble selfishness and interdependence, where I see the evolution for people in kind of three stages, right? So the first evolution is when they are the dependent stage, for like they're obviously they don't they can't source the strength within. So they're de de dependent here. Then they go into like the first part of the program where we learn, we teach them how to source their strength from within. And they kind of go to the other extreme a bit. They overcorrect to the side of selfish independence, right? Yeah. It's like, I can source it myself, but I'm going to question the world in symptoms like, if it doesn't serve me, I don't want it, right? What, for example, like a lot of people, when they grow themselves, they're like, why am I fighting for this relationship? You know, I don't care anymore. I can get anyone I want now. But then as you keep growing, you go into the middle again, and that's a stage of noble independence where you're now seeking win-wins. You're not seeking win-lose or lose-win. You're seeking win-wins. And you actually have the internal strength to create those win-wins where now the relationship becomes more of a team yeah, and becomes one, all right? Um, and that's... The beautiful place to be at it's like the in the middle space again again answers are never in the extreme is always in the middle right <laughs> that's it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah the balance the balance the balance uh, oh my goodness you know there's there's just one more thing that um like i'm, I'm gonna just break the fourth wall here but like you know if if you think if you think this is about manipulating or, or changing your partner or you know, manufacturing uh, something else. It's like what I've gone through over these past few months for me has been my own mountain. See, at the beginning, I always thought of it as I was climbing this mountain to get to the top to slay this dragon. And that dragon is uh, the resistance that I'm facing. That dragon is the, the breakup or that dragon is whatever it is, right? I'm climbing this mountain. I'm starting to realize that actually the mountain I'm supposed to climb is at the top is, is this other dragon. And that dragon is all of the internal stuff within me. So, mm. you know, one of the biggest things that I've taken away from this, this whole process so far is the more you work on yourself or the more that I continue to, to reiterate my own life, the more power that gives me to be able to do anything else outside of that. But it only starts within because, you know, like if, if I'm climbing this other mountain, but I'm still my weak self, if I'm climbing this other mountain, I'm ill-equipped. I'm going to fail. No matter how high I get, I'm going to fail. So it really, the training that I'm doing in the background here has been a just about me, has been about my own internal shifts, because that's the only person I can control. I can't control other people. I can only control me. And so for the first time in my life, I'm investing in me. For the first time in my life, you know, if, if, if my partner can spend money to, like, you know, get her own place and, live her own life, I can spend a little bit of money investing in my own self and my own development, something that I've been so skeptical of in the past. But for once, <laughs> honestly, it's like, wow, like, why was I not given this before? Why did I not allow myself to have this opportunity in the past? Yeah. So a couple of avenues I want to go to there. You know, the way I see this is there's a kind of two philosophies of how you get your relationship back. The one philosophy is let me learn the tactics to try to control my partner to come back. If you want that, I would suggest you spend like a couple of thousand, a couple of hundred exploring those approaches and see if it works. The other approach is you grow yourself to the point where you become so irreplaceable. You become so undeniable that you just become the obvious choice. This approach will claim that it's fast meaning like the approach of trying to control other people 
they will tout, I can do this in two weeks. Here's how to get your partner in bed right now. But it's not going to last, right? This side where you're growing yourself, that takes longer. It takes a lot of patience. You, you took five, four or five months. Correct. Yeah. Other clients are like up to a year sometimes. But once you do it, it's forever. And when I say it's forever, I mean that the success principles that allows you to be successful in your relationship allows you to be successful in all areas of life. Antithetic thinking, for example, is success, is, can make you successful in all areas of life. You look at any successful business person, leader, whatever it is, uh, really creative entrepreneurs, they're always antithetic. They're always antithetic, right? So this is growing you. And it has to be you. Because if it's not about growing you, then your partner can never really understand that your decision to work on yourself is unconditional. If she can sense a little bit of like, oh, he's doing this only because of me. She knows that when you get back together, you will stop every change that you have promised because you fundamentally do not have the right motivation for why you stick with the process. You don't enjoy the process, so you'll abandon it once the catalyst and the motivator for the process is gone, right? In this case, the motivator for a lot of people is the fear of losing their partner. Once that fear is gone, they will stop trying. And their partner knows that. They can smell that, you know? Um, to end here, you mentioned... Um, you know, buying programs like mine was something that you were skeptical of at first. Tell me your thinking. Like, what made you skeptical of my program before you signed on? Oh, well, I mean, if you think about it, it's like thousands of free stuff online, YouTube. And that's how I used to learn. It's free, it's free, I can get it from here. You know, it's like five minute video there, 10 minute video over there. I'm gonna get all the answers from all of these free videos from all over the place. I think I've got this, right? <laughs> I can synthesize it myself eventually. Yeah, yeah. I'm right. gonna I'm gonna create my own like course out of all of this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so that's you know, that's what I felt. That's what I thought. I, I but then I start to realize, hang on, like there is something here that I definitely don't know. There is something here that I don't think 10 minutes can cover. There is some, and, and I'm starting to see patterns as well, uh, where I'm starting to see there is definitely something more to this that I think I need to explore. And the more that I started to, to think about, I realized this guy, <laughs> Jeffrey, has done his homework. This guy isn't talking from like this sort of airy fairy space of like, you know, we're going to channel all your energies into like, you know, nothing against that if you're into that, right? Um, <laughs> he's not talking from the space of like tactical manipulation and scripts. There is something else beneath this. There is some deep neuroscience, some deep psychology, some deep sociology that exists beneath this. And so, you know, I'm used to watching those like 15, 20 minute videos that you put out. But the minute that I jumped into the course, you know, and, and, and I really had to sort of overcome that barrier by asking myself, okay, what, what is this really worth? Like, what is knowledge to me going to be really worth? Like, I can either like go about doing the exact same thing that I used to do and, and keep learning from free videos, but it's, it's going to reach a natural limit. Or am I going to do this really difficult thing to get an outcome that is, is almost impossible? Am I going to delve into something that is going to change my life? So. What's funny was as soon as I jumped into it, we went from like 10, 15, 20 minute free videos to now two, three hour modules. It's long. Modules. <laughs> yeah. It's I know long. because when I record those things, my throat hurts for like three days afterwards. Yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's painful to record those. Yeah. So my goodness, like as soon as I honestly, as soon as I open that up, I go, holy moly. This has been like the amount of information here, the amount like the group, the, the coaching, the amount of information that I'm getting, the, the hundred plus hours, the, the, the training that we watch. It's, how do I explain it? Honestly, like I, I, 
like I'm trying to not sound like pitchy on this, but I don't know why you're not pricing your program so much higher. Like, I don't know why, um, like, and I can understand because there are a lot of, like, I, I believe that you're operating at like, how many people can I change? How many people can I, how many lives can I affect? And what is the, what is the best way to get people to do that? And of course, whilst changing lives, I'm guessing that you also want to be adequately compensated for the you know thousands of hours that you put into this as yeah. well and, and, and hosting it and, and all of the work that goes behind and paying all the people that you put into researching this. But I feel like I'm getting the better end of the deal here. Like, <laughs> like, yeah. like I feel like I'm ripping you off here. <laughs> no, um, yeah, I mean, I it's, it's always a dilemma for me, right? Because um, yeah, it's always that I want the money. But at the same time, I also want to help as many people as possible. So what's the perfect balance, the perfect equilibrium that I can use for that? Um, I don't know. It's always a question that we have in mind and the equilibrium might change. But really, I've been happy with the types of clients that we have been able to attract, guys like you. And it just, um, you know, it, it's still, it's a pinch moment for me to this day to see so many men who are willing to go through this journey with me, right? And who are willing to go to such high levels of self-growth with me. Like when I first started this business, I thought I was going to target to women because I thought women cared more about this than men. But I quickly saw like once soon as they launched the first YouTube videos, it was men. It was men reaching out to me the whole way. And I was like, this is fucking awesome. Like um, as a man, I get to help other men grow to their maximum potential. Fuck yeah. <laughs> Let's keep doing this. But um, all our focus right now is focusing on finishing V3, which we're a couple of months out from that. Once we do that, I think we're going to have like multiple tiers to the program where we have like a mastermind thing where I will step away a little bit from the main one and go into this mastermind one where it's a higher ticket where people are really serious about getting help. And then here's where the self-sustaining community right that we have now yeah. Uh, that's the kind of the current priced um, um, program there. But yeah, I'm sure there's a, there's a will, there's a way <laughs> on that one. I mean, honestly, and, and I've spoken to so many of like, just, you know, I call them friends now because, you know, they're, they're people that have journeyed along with me um, in, this, in this whole process. Like every one of us agrees that this is something that is life-changing. And I don't mean that in, a, in the cheesy sort of like, you know, salesy way. It is like, you know, honest heart to heart. Like we all believe that this happened and it is something that stays with us for life. Yeah. So that's yeah. a, you know, just thank you. Honestly, I just yeah. want to say thank you for everything. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> for sure. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, so guys, if you resonated with this and you want to take on this journey with me, Michael and thousands of others right now, in this journey of self-growth and just untapping your maximum potential where you grow so high that reconciliation becomes a side effect <laughs> of what you do. Um, I have a masterclass. It's an hour and a half long. You can click on it down below this video uh, in the comments below or description below. Check it out. See if it's for you or not. I'm not going to pressure you either way, mm -hmm. right? Um, at the end of the masterclass, if you want to submit your application, you can do that. We have a survey that you have to fill out and you, you can book a call as well. Be sure you mm -hmm are detailed with the survey that you fill out. Um, we do try to help as many people as possible, but I also have to think about my own sanity. So we only really accept less than 10% of clients um, and 10% of applicants. So make sure you pay attention to that survey and make sure you fill it out properly. Um, but yeah, I hope to see a lot of you guys there in the program who are listening to this, but Michael, this has been amazing. This is like an hour and a half of my one of some of my favorite conversations the depth of this conversation is something i really enjoy um Thank you. i if anybody right doubts anything here again <laughs> leave a comment um because i think it'll be a shame if the message here gets lost because you cannot get over the politics of could this be real or not um, because this is real. Michael is a real person. We can show you proof that he is. Um, we can show you proof that he's a real student in the program. We can show you proof. I mean, we can drown you with proof. Just ask for us. 
like legit. Because yeah. I know sometimes like when we say all these claims, it can be really hard for people to believe, but you know, it's, 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 it's incredible. So Michael, thank you so much. Thank you, Jeffrey. I, I appreciate everything you've done and, and appreciate this opportunity. And, and thanks everyone for listening, of course. For sure. All right, Michael, you have a good day. I have a good night. Cheers, buddy. <laughs> thank you. Bye. See you later. <laughs>